I'm Deborah. This is Booking with Deborah. Today's video is a recent reads wrap up. So the, I'm going to be talking about most of the books that I have read in March and April. Before I get into those books, I've just mentioned I have also recently done a wrap up for the books that I have been reading for my Read Around the World challenge. So this is a bit of a catch up video really for everything that I read in March and April that wasn't part of my Read Around the World challenge. So the first book that I am still reading, which I have mentioned for, I've been mentioning for a while, is Great Expectations. Um, I read that throughout March and April. After being a little bit unwell a bit earlier on this year, I did get quite behind on reading this book. So quite a lot of my reading in March was to get caught up with where we were with the um, read-along so then I could participate a bit more in the read-along. So this did up, take up quite a bit of my reading in March. At the time of filming this, we haven't finished the read-along, so I won't be wrapping this book up as of yet, but I will do at some point in future. And then another book that ended up taking up quite a bit of my reading in March was this one, which is Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. I read this again as part of a read-along uh, with Gem of Books and I will link her channel down below. And the read-along was for, for this book was supposed to be in April, but I went off on a bit of an unplanned tangent with the read-along. <laughs> Um, so this is quite a chunky book, it's 530 pages and it's got four parts to it. And when we were due to start the read-along in April, I was thinking I'll never be able to read a 530-page book in one month. I'm not going to be able to keep up with everybody. And I was a bit conscious that I was going to get behind and not be able to participate. So I thought I'll get a head start and I'll read the first book in March and then... As we're going to April, I'll have a bit of a head start and I'll hopefully be able to keep up. I think it didn't quite go to plan, but not in a bad way. <laughs> in the way that once I started reading this book, I just couldn't stop. <laughs> because it was so good and I enjoyed it so much. Um, I'm not going to wrap it up today because I've already discussed it in my Read Around the World wrap up video, which I'll link in the description box down below. But it ended up but I just got so hooked, hooked into it in March when I started reading it that I did just carry on reading it. I did end up finishing it in the April, but it took up quite a bit of reading in March. So the other books that I then went on to read in April were mostly the books that I read for the April uh, Disability Readathon. And the first of those is a poetry collection, and that is Perseverance by Raymond Antrobus. So this is a poetry collection that explores poems around the author's experience of growing up death, his dual heritage, he is a British Jamaican poet, and also um, his experiences around a relationship with his father and the death of his father. With all poetry collections there were some poems in this poetry collection that kind of spoke to me more than others and had a greater impact on me than others and I've written some notes about some of the ones that kind of stood out most for me and the, the first the first of those was a poem called Jamaican British where um, Raymond explores his dual heritage and how other people responded to his dual heritage which often left him with a sense of not belonging anywhere neither being British nor Jamaican um, so that, that was very interesting. And then another poem that really stood out for me was Dear Hearing World. So with, with Raymond, his parents and his doctors did not realise at birth he was deaf and he was actually, um, it doesn't say how old he was, but he was already at the age where um, his parents and doctors would have expected him to have been speaking before they realised that he was actually deaf. The po and the poem Dear Hearing World was a really powerful kind of um, reflection of his experiences. So I was just going to read a short extract from that poem. I call you out for refusing to acknowledge sign language in classrooms, for assessing deaf students on what they can't say instead of what they can. We did not ask to be a part of your hearing world. I can't hear my joints crack, but I can feel them. I am sick of sounding out your rules. You tell me I breathe too loud and it's rude to make noise when I eat. Sent me to speech therapists. Said I was speaking a language of holes. And then there were two other poems in this collection that again really stood out for me. But they were where the... Um, that they were where Raymond was exploring the treatment of deaf people in other parts of the world. And the first of those poems was called For Jesuela Gellin, Vanessa Preville, 
and Monique Vincent and that was a poem that explored the um, experience of what happened to these three women in Haiti in 2016. They were um, all deaf women who were living independently within a deaf community and they were sort of financially independent which was quite unusual in the community that they were a part of. During some storms they were separated from their community and sadly they ended up being murdered and the justification for their murder was that the perpetrator believed the women were evil spirits who meant to do them harm because they were deaf. And that was not um, an incident that I was aware of until I read the poem so I did go away and, and read it round a little bit more about that. And then a second poem was called Two Guns in the Sky for, Dan for Daniel Harris and that brought to my attention an incident that again I wasn't familiar with um, Daniel Harris was an unarmed deaf man and he was shot by police in um, 20, also in 2016 and witnesses at the incident claimed that all that Daniel was trying to do was communicate with the police officers using line, sign language and they assumed that he was armed and, and shot him dead. So both of those po poems were really powerful and really did sort of awaken my um, sort of awareness and understanding of treatment of deaf people in other parts of the world. So in terms of star ratings, I gave this collection, I gave this book four out of five stars. There were some really powerful poems in this collection and it really did help me reflect on the deaf experience in a way that I've not done before. The next book that I read for the Disability Readathon is this one, which was Girl in the Window by Penny Jolson. The main character and the author of this book have ME and chronic fatigue. This is a YA novel and it's about a young woman called Cassia who is experiencing um, chronic fatigue. As a result of it, has to spend an awful lot of her time um, sort of stuck in her bedroom, often stuck in bed. Even getting up and down stairs is a challenge for her. And very early on in the book, she witnesses out of her bedroom window what she thinks could have been a kidnapping of another uh, young woman. And at the time it happens, she happens to look across the street into the property across the street and thinks she sees another young woman in the window who could have been a potential witness. So when she, she, so she reports that, but then she's told by the people living across the street and the police that there is no young woman living across the street. There are two sort of strands to this book. The first is the part where it explores Cassia's life, um, which I thought was done very well obviously the author is able to draw on their own experiences of having ME and it looks at how Cassie herself feels around her ME but also how the people around her react to her ME and how they treat her and how they perceive her so it explores things like her parents, her friends, her school teachers and neighbours and things like that and I thought that was handed very, handled very sensitively and I also think it gave you a really good insight into what it would feel like to have um, chronic fatigue or ME for a long period of time and feel sort of cut off and isolated. And then the second strand of this book is all about this mysterious young woman who may or may not have been in the window. And I can't say anything about that strand without spoiling this book. But what I would say is I feel there's some trigger warnings in this book that I wasn't expecting going into. So it would and I can't even say what the trigger warnings are without um, giving spoilers about the second strand of the story so it would be something to look into if you're interested in reading this book and you feel that there may be something for you around triggers it's not around the chronic fatigue and the illness it's around something completely different I was really pleased to see a YA book tackling the issues that are in this book actually with this book I also re what I also really appreciated was the fact that the author goes into detail at the end of the research that they've done around both chronic fatigue and ME but also the other storyline and then another book that I picked up for the disability readathon is this lovely book which is The Tea Dragon Society by Katie O'Neill. So this is obviously a book de designed for younger readers but I'd seen images of this book on booktube and I thought well I'm going to use this readathon as an excuse to get this book out of the library. This book is a, um, a kind of fairy tale about a young character called Greta who is an adventurous blacksmith apprentice. And it's about some of the people that she meets and how she becomes involved in the enchanting world of the Tea Dragon Society. I loved the concept of the Tea Dragon Society, which is about these small dragons 
that um, grow like herbal tea leaves on their on their antlers I think are they called antlers I'm not sure um and it's all about how you, um, you can befriend and care for and look after these tea dragons to then generate these sort of tea leaves to make herbal tea um I've mentioned on my tone before that plant medicine and herbal tea is something that I am personally really interested in um, so this was kind of like a childhood version of my passions as an adult reader and if I'd have been younger when I'd got this book I know I would have loved this book and thought it was absolutely incredible just for the tea dragon element of it. The back of this book has extracts from the Tea Dragon Society handbook which I actually really enjoyed I thought they were really sweet it talks about the different types of tea dragons that there are um, this, how to look after them, what sort of tea they grow, how to care for your dragon, how to form a relationship with your tea dragon. So I thought that was really lovely. There's some really good diverse representation within this book and the artwork within this book is really lovely. So I'll just show you one of the big spreads within the book. The comic strip and then a section from the handbook at the back. It looks like this. So this might be something that if you've got any younger readers in your life they might be interested in. I appreciate I'm not the target audience for this book. But even as an adult reader I wasn't 100% sure about the story. Just felt a little bit disjointed. But I think that might be because it's the first in a series so this was kind of world building. Juicing us to characters that I'm assuming are going to go on more adventures in the other books in the series. And I would definitely like to have a tea dragon in my life. So the next book I wanted to talk about is The Reasons I Jump, The Inner Voice of a 13 year old boy with autism by Naoko Higashada and the translators are Kiko Yoshida and David Mitchell. So this book is quite an interesting short read with quite an interesting backstory. So my understanding of this book is that it was actually one of the teachers of uh, Naoki who designed an alphabet type grid to help him communicate his thoughts and the the communication that this teacher had with Naoki was then printed into a book in Japan and then this was then translated and then it's been proven to be really beneficial in helping people to kind of learn and understand more about uh, children with autism. So the structure of this book is that it's quite in quite short sections in a kind of question and answer style where um, it, I think it's like the teacher is asking uh, Naoki questions and then Naoki's responses are then put into the book. And the questions that are being asked are some of the sort of common questions that get asked around people with autism and around the behaviours that often people with autism can demonstrate. So some of the standout questions for me that were in this book um, asked things like, why do you ask the same question over and over again? Why are you so fussy about what you eat? And why are your seat plans all messed up? One thing about this book that I did find a bit, I was a bit unsure about was the translation of it. So even the wording of those questions are a bit like, you're asking a child the questions in, in that way. Um, and some of the answers seemed a little bit, um, I kept thinking between the answers, is this how a 13 year old would would speak? But I think it's to do with the method, obviously, that this communication is through this alphabet grid, but also potentially the translation of the book. So I think if you can get past the, the, the language and actually just get behind the, the answers, I actually found the content really quite useful and really quite informative. What it did do was demonstrate how the young boy with autism feels, perceives and the way he responds to the world and help to explain why people without autism can find it quite difficult to understand the behaviour of somebody with autism. So I gave this book 3.5 out of 5 stars. I thought it was a really excellent introduction to anybody who does want to learn more about autism. The next book I wanted to talk about that I also listened to for Disability Readathon is Reasons You Shouldn't Love Me by Amy Trigg. This is actually a play on, Audible, on the Audible Plus catalogue and it was the winner of the Women's Prize for Playwriting in 2020. I actually thought this was a very good play and I would recommend it to Audible members. Juno was born with spina bifida and is now clumsily navigating her 20s amid street healers, love, loneliness 
and the feeling of being an unfinished project. Play looks back at her life so far, her experiences at school, her first kiss, first relationships and first sexual experiences, going to parties and how others perceive and treat her because of her disability. I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. At times this play was very funny and very entertaining and at times it was also really heartfelt and honest and you really did get a understanding of Juno's experiences of, of, of ableism. And then the other books that I wanted to mention which were outside of the disability reader form. The first one was Anne of Avonlea by L.M. Montgomery which I'm reading as part of the Anne Along for the Anne of Green Gables series with Emily and I will link her channel in the description box down below. This book was first published in 1909. I can't say too much about this book because it is the second in a series but in this book we join Anne when she's 16 years old as she's starting her kind of working life as a teacher and at first I was a bit like she's 16 <laughs> what do you mean she's a teacher but at the time the teaching profession was not as it was today just like with Anne of Green Gables there's some really funny moments in this book where we hear about Anne's experiences as a teacher both good days and bad days and some of the children that she works alongside and some of the funny things that they say and that they do Anne continues to have this amazing wonderful creative imagination that seems to help her maintain and build her resilience things that life throw at her and that was something that I really appreciated in this book still. I gave this book three out of five stars. I didn't enjoy it anywhere near as much as Anne of Green Gables. I think the first Anne of Green Gables book was, is probably going to be the favourite for me but it was nice to sort of rejoin Anne and see what happened after she kind of left school herself. And then the final two books that I wanted to talk about are both books that I listen to as my bedtime listens. First one of those is The Ladies Midnight Swimming Club by Faith Hogan. This book is about three women who are at very, very different stages of their lives, all living in a quite small community on the Irish coast. Elizabeth Husband dies, leaving her with crippling debt. Lucy wants to leave her old life behind as an inner city hospital doctor and make a fresh start. Jo's world is turned upside down when she receives some shocking news. So this book explored the backstories of each of the three main characters and some of the other people living in the local community. And one of the things that most drew me to this book was the title of the book, The Midnight Swimming Club, um, because while swimming is something that I'm really quite interested to do more of in my life, when, when the three um, women become friends, they start to find solace together in this midnight swimming club where they go swimming, obviously at midnight, into the Irish Sea. So I gave this book 3.5 out of 5 stars. It was just an easy listen for me, although it did tackle some really quite sensitive and difficult subjects. I won't go into those because I don't want to give any spoilers spoilers for this book. This book felt a little bit like a Mauve Binchy book, so anybody who's read Mauve Binchy, it felt a little bit like a Mauve Binchy in the sense that it explores a small Irish community and really gets behind the characters in that community and you, you start to feel like you really get to know the characters and their life story. So that was an enjoyable, easy bedtime listen for me. And then the final book that I wanted to talk about, again, was a bedtime listen, and that is The Lost Tide of Warriors. By Catherine Doyle and I'm not going to say too much about this book because it's the second in a middle grade series that I've been listening to. It's all about a young boy called Fionn Boyle and his adventures on Aramore Island. The island has a stormkeeper but their role is much more complex and magical than it sounds. In this book thousands of terrifying soul stalkers arrive on the island and it's all about how the island's inhabitants and the island itself deal with the impending doom and their island being overtaken. I gave this book a 3.5 out of 5 stars. I didn't enjoy it as much as the first one, but it was still a fast-paced and fun, enjoyable middle grade. And I've already got the third book in the trilogy to have the bedtime listen at some point in the future. Those are all the books that I read in March and April outside of my Read Around the World books. And I will link in the description box below that video if you want to go and check that out and see the books that I have been reading between January and the end of April for my Read Around the World challenge. I'd be really interested to know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books. If you did, what do you think of them? Are you interested in reading of these any of these books? Have you read anything recently that you would like to recommend? Please leave your comments in the section box down below. If you've enjoyed this video, please like it. If you've not subscribed already, please do so. I really, really do appreciate everybody 
who likes one of my videos, who subscribes to my videos, who watches my videos and who takes the time to comment. So I just want you to say thank you very much for your support. That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye.